If you guys would open your Bibles uh, to chapter 28 of the book of Acts. This is our very last week in the book of Acts. And we've been in Acts for 16 weeks, uh, which is probably the longest uh, we've been in a single book, uh, probably in the last three years uh, that I can think of, Um, which is interesting. So I had a a weird experience uh, this week. I walked into the building and I saw the wall in the sanctuary uh, torn out and felt like I was gonna have a panic attack. (laughs) Uh, I knew it was happening, but seeing it was weird. So uh, historically, I have not been great at finishing things. Um, If you've ever taken uh, the Strengths Finder, uh, Clifton Strengths Finder, it's one of those personality tests, uh, one of my top signature strengths is activator, which means really good at starting things. Finishing things is not one of my, one of my signature strengths. And, uh, and so seeing the, the wall torn out uh, made me panic a bit because I thought, I'm never going to finish this. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I don't have to. Somebody else is finishing it. Um, but I have enough sort of semi-begun projects in my life uh, that I just... I saw that and I immediately thought that's what was happening. Uh, The beginning of a project was was happening that might not ever uh, come to completion, which which is challenging for me uh, to think about because the Christian faith is about finishing well. A lot of people start the Christian faith and they don't finish. And there are a lot of reasons why people don't finish the Christian faith. Why they don't walk it out to their final days. And we were in Matthew earlier this year, and we were in Mark earlier this year, and so we remember the parables of uh, the soils, and we remember that, that there are some real reasons why we don't finish the journey. Maybe we never build roots deep enough Uh, to sustain a real life. Maybe we let the cares of the world, distractions, turn us away, choke out the the new life that that we have experienced in Christ. Whatever it is, there's a range of reasons, right? Right? Why we don't finish. And and so it's actually a really interesting spiritual discipline for me. Uh, that I go through on a regular basis that makes finishing a book weird. Uh, because in some ways, I, I see it as a, a gift of grace from the Lord that, that each time I start a book, I also finish it. Um, that there's something in there. It's a little act of beginning something and seeing it through. But, it, but it's not just me, right? We do this together. Uh, as you... Use the daily worship guide daily, uh, daily, because it's a daily worship guide. Uh, (laughs) As you use that and prepare yourself to come into this space and to worship together uh, week after week for 16 weeks in the book of Acts, as you participate in a small group and week after week open your life to God's word and wrestle with it and learn and allow God to, uh, to meet you in your desires, to affirm some of your desires and, and to challenge you in, in some of your desires. And as God begins to say, this might be a more faithful path forward to do that day after day and come to a group where you do that together and continue that for 16 weeks is, is no small matter. To begin something and then finish something is not easy. And we're right uh, on the front end of New Year's when all kinds of people will, will make New Year's resolutions to begin new things and, and they may or they may not uh, carry those out to completion. And so the book of Acts in many ways uh, not just because we have finished it, uh, reminds us 
of the, the call to persevere, the call to finish well, but because of Paul specifically, because of the way that Paul lives out his life, because of the way that he ends uh, his work, because of the way that the book ends thinking about who Paul is and what he's up to, we have to think about what is it that God has called us to do and how are we living into that in, in some sort of, of meaningful way. If you have endured through Acts, whether it's through just the daily worship guide, whether it's just through uh, being a part on Sunday mornings and really uh, allowing this time and space to challenge you, or whether it's uh, through small groups, um, by the time you get to these last couple chapters of Acts, you should be challenged in the way that you know God, the way that you think about God, the way that you desire God and his kingdom, and the way that, that you live. Uh, it would be impossible, maybe, maybe not impossible, to really devote yourself to the study of Acts and then go on living as though you had never read it in the first place. There's some really challenging things that, that we face here in these last couple chapters. And if you've allowed God to change the way that you think, and if you allowed God to change the way that you desire, and if you've allowed God to change the way that you live, um, you just can't read these passages the same way that you always have. And we find that true in chapter 27. Uh, starting in verse 13, we come across a really bizarre story. It, it may not seem bizarre, but it, it is for so many reasons, right? So we start reading, now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. And so if, if you know what's going on here, um, or I if you should say if you don't know what's going on here, Paul is a prisoner on a ship. Remember, we've, we've, we looked at his trials in Jerusalem. He's been put on a ship. He's being shipped to Rome. He's got some companions with him. Uh, and there are people who are, you know, running the ship. But soon, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught, and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. And can you hear... Uh, First of all, there's this incredible attention to detail. There, there have been chapters in the past where it's like, and then three years went by, and then you move on. Here, I mean, we are getting the direction of the wind. It's, it's remarkable. And, and so Acts isn't really just telling us a story about a stormy sea. It's sort of drawing us into this story. The details allow us to picture the wind actually blowing on this ship and changing its direction, pushing it off course. The ship then out of control is in dangerous waters. Then the ship passes near an island. So get this, it's, it's been pushed off course by winds so strong, but now it's behind an island, and so it's sort of temporarily protected. And so during this brief respite from the storm, the crew, the passengers do everything they can to prepare the boat for what's coming next. They secured the lifeboat. They protected the shell of the ship so that it wouldn't break apart under the crushing waves. They did each of these things methodically only to then be driven again the moment they come out from behind this, this small island. 
And this storm is just too much for them. It was beyond human ingenuity for sailors of their day. And it only got worse. So bad, in fact, that they began throwing over uh, the ship's cargo. And when it still doesn't get better, they start throwing everything that's not tacked down. Days pass, but the darkness never ends. No break, no light, until all hope is given up. The details of the story are so powerful and they're so striking, right? That, I mean, it doesn't take much to sit with it and sort of think about it before we find ourselves imagining the storm, thinking ourselves in it, wondering how would we fare as, as sailors with Paul? Would we lose hope? The story is incredibly precise. Naming the specifics of a unique story that took place at a unique time in a unique place with real people like Paul and his companions and those who are on the ship, the centurion. But the story is somehow powerfully universal at the same time. Have you ever experienced the disappearance of all light from your life? Where it felt as though there was no sun, not even starlight, so that after so many days, you gave up hope of being saved. I've heard friends use this exact language to describe the kind of, of deep depression that feels so impossibly thick that there can't possibly be an escape. Depression that feels like it will never end, it will never lift. In fact, it's two years ago, exactly this week, the final week of Advent, that one of this church's close friends, Taylor Austin, uh, Bob and Kathy's son, was with us in worship, and he shared his own personal lament and using the book of Lamentations as his guide, Taylor wrote and then shared this poetic description of the circumstances he found himself in. As he read for us that morning, he used this exact language, the language of darkness, the language of hopelessness, to, to help us feel what he was feeling. And he expressed real uncertainty about what he might face in the future, about what he might lose in the days ahead. On top of that, he honestly shared that he was experiencing real doubt about, about where God might be in any of the details and especially in the details of his future. One of the hardest parts of Taylor's journey and struggle was that he, he felt as though he had been on God's path for him. He was pursuing a life of ministry, a call. And now, out of his control, was a set of circumstances that threatened that call. And, and this is where we find Paul and his companions. They're on their way to Rome, where God has told Paul that he will preach the gospel. There's nothing to suggest that these men, apart from that call, will be saved from a shipwreck. Actually, what's so interesting about this, this passage is the way that it actually describes their loss of hope. They don't lose all hope. They also don't lose hope as a sort of general idea or like a thing. In fact, they don't even lose it. They abandon it. But again, not just some generic hope. No, they let go of all hope that they will be saved. They, they give up hope that Jesus will calm this storm that they're currently in. They lay down hope that their ship will safely arrive at, at its destination. They stop hoping that God is going to miraculously intervene. This Paul, remember, right, the giant of our, who shares our Christian faith, the one who, who the scripture set up as a model for Christ-like imitation, he 
walks away from hope that they all will be saved. How do you feel about that? What do you make of that? It's important. If we haven't been with Paul from the beginning of the journey, we might not grasp what's happening here. The very next thing that happens, God meets Paul that night and confirms the call that he gave him. That he is going to make it to Rome and he is going to preach. And so Paul is able to, to proclaim this to the, the people on the ship. But sometimes when we lose faith or lose hope that in a particular outcome of the circumstances in our life, some well-meaning Christians are quick to say, well, you just lack faith. You just lack the faith that God will intervene here, that God will do something, right? And, and actually, we heard Jane uh, several weeks ago talk about what this passage was doing to her, uh, in her, as she started to think back to the stories of Jesus calming the sea with his disciples, right? Because one of the ways that we often hear that passage preached is Jesus calms the storm. Jesus calms the storm. He can, he can calm the storms of your life. Jesus wants to calm the storms of your life. Just call out to him. Save us, Jesus. And nobody calms this storm. In fact, uh, 2 Corinthians tells us that this is the third storm. Well, actually, we don't know how many storms. This is the third ship that Paul is on that wrecks. How about that for a batting average, right? <laughs> if you count the disciples, he's got one out of four. Well, so 250. Uh, but there are others who die in shipwrecks. What, what do we make of that? So let me pose that to you. And actually, some of you have... have been studying this, have been thinking about this? How do we make sense of the loss of hope that they will be saved? Is this an act of faithlessness? Or is it something else? There is a, there's a sense here that, that we have to learn to distinguish between Salvation, the, the work of salvation, right? The, uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus that saves us from our sins, that saves, right? This big salvation and salvation from a particular set of circumstances and salvation in this instance. Consider Paul and Paul's definition of salvation. Twice he's been saved from a wrecked ship. So part of the expectation here is that the storm would disappear, that the, the ship might be saved. Uh, but even the difference here between how God might save someone in the midst of the circumstances, we tend to have a, a, a really clear idea of how we'd like to be saved. God, this is really how it's going to work out best for me. If, if you would just get rid of the, the storm, then our ship could just kind of get there. And then we don't have to like worry about the whole like survival thing in the water, cold, right? All hope was lost. And yet everything that we know about Paul from the preceding chapters and what comes after I think you can make a strong case that, that Paul's hope in the resurrection never wavers. There's no sense that Paul is afraid. Even when he tells the people early on 
that, guys, if we go, if we go right now, we're going to die. Like, that's, that's what's in, in store for us. And he just accepts that. Because for Paul, if, if he dies, he understands what God intends to do. He intends to raise the dead on that final day. And so Paul is unshaken. And even in this moment, he seems to give up the possibility that God is going to preserve this ship. And that's not faithlessness. It's not faithlessness when somebody is nearing death and they say, I'm okay with dying. It's not faithlessness when they say, if God were to, to end my life now, if God were to receive me, um, I would be okay with it. That's not faithlessness. In fact, that is hope in the gospel. And one of the ways these final chapters push us to rethink the simplistic ways that we think about who God is and what God is doing is right after this shipwreck. And they are shipwrecked. <laughs> they end up on this island. And it's fascinating, right? Because they just survived a shipwreck. I mean, Paul has survived near-death beatings, near-death stonings, near-death shipwrecks. And here's just one more of them. He gets onto this island. He shows up. There's these, this group of people that sort of create this hospitable space. They say, welcome, come and be with us. Uh, there's a fire and a snake bites uh, bites Paul and the, the locals, they know what this means. He has to die. This is a poisonous snake. And so they think in simplistic terms, well, he must be supposed to die. If you've ever seen any of the Final Destination movies, the idea is really simplistic. Your time is up. And you must die. If somehow you avoid dying in the moment you were supposed to die, death will catch up to you. And this is exactly the story that's being told with Paul on Malta. Uh, he, he arrives and he survived the shipwreck, but death will not let him go. And the snake gets him. And then he doesn't die. And what do the simplistic, superstitious people of that place do? Yeah, they think he's a god, and so they start to worship him because this is the overly simplistic way we think about who God is and, and what God might be doing in the world. Uh, we start adding up numbers, and if they equal something, we go, oh, that must be the way that it is. And yet, the story that God has been telling through Acts is infinitely more complex. The circumstances of your life, uh, this is so important, the circumstances of your life do not say anything necessarily about how much God loves you, about the favor that you have with God, about God's anger with you, about God's disappointment with you. If you suddenly uh, came into a, a large sum of money, that would not mean that you have God's favor. Maybe it does, but maybe it doesn't. This is the story that Acts is telling us, that God and his ways are fairly mysterious. And so those things that we're tempted to say, this is a sign that God is for you, well, what if it's not? What if God is up to something else? This is a sign that God is against you. Well, what if it's not? What if God is up to something else? What if all of the circumstances of our lives call us to submit our lives to God's word, to open our ears, to open our hearts, to hear who God is and what God is doing, and to say, okay, God, now how do I respond here? What do I do here and now? And the way that this is uh, given to us most profoundly is in the final words of this, of this book. Starting in verse 30. We find Paul, he's arrived in Rome. This is where he was heading all along. He's there. He's been looking forward to it. And it turns out he's still in prison. It says he lived there for two whole years at his own expense. So I don't know what you know about ancient prisons, but um, ancient prisons weren't like modern prisons. If you were in a prison you lived or you died based on the hospitality, the generosity of those you knew. 
So if you went to prison and you didn't have a community of support, you didn't have friends or family or people who cared whether you lived or died, you died. It's pretty simple. If you went to prison and uh, there was food available for you, it was only because somebody cared to feed you, to bring food to this place where you were at. Uh, Some of Paul's letters give us the impression that churches like the church in Philippi are sending resources to Paul while he's in prison over large uh, uh, geographical expanses in order to sustain his life. And so he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. When we know what Paul went through, when we know who rejected him, when we know who abused him, when we know who oppressed him, when we know who persecuted him, when we know the natural uh, uh, events that crushed him physically, there's one thing, there's one hope that Jesus continues to cling to, that Paul continues to cling to, And that is Jesus. And that is the kingdom of God. The kingdom that Jesus right now reigns over. Right? So what that means is that it doesn't matter if Paul's in prison. It doesn't matter if he dies in prison. It doesn't matter if he gets out of prison. It doesn't matter if he has everything. It doesn't matter if he has nothing. It doesn't matter if he's on a ship that makes it to its destination or if he is on a ship that takes a insane route to get to that destination. It doesn't matter if the ship doesn't make it, if it's crushed and he has to find another way to where God is bringing him. It doesn't matter what is going on. Wherever he's at, whoever's in front of him, Paul is going to proclaim the good news about Jesus. He's going to proclaim the truth that God's kingdom is breaking into this world and that Jesus, the king of that kingdom, is worthy of all of his trust. And that trust is not a trust that the circumstances are going to work out exactly how he thinks they should. It's a trust that no matter what happens, even if the circumstances hap- happen complete opposite what I want, that God is still good, that his kingdom is still breaking in, that his promises that that kingdom will take over and, be, and establish itself in, in the creations, in the one creation, I don't think there are multiple creations, in the single creation, the new one, that that, that promise is going to be fulfilled. This is what Paul announces every chance he gets wherever he's at. And so this is actually the, the ridiculous uh, clue to the end of this story. There are these two verses. Think about where we've been. We've been on this like eight chapter journey that's covered like a couple months. His arrest, his imprisonment, um, actually he was, he was in, imprisoned in Jerusalem and Caesarea for a little bit longer, but I mean, the detail that we got of the interactions, of the trials, of everything he went through, of the details of where the ship went during the shipwreck, all of this stuff, we get all of this insane detail. And then these final two two verses, he lived there for two whole years. And what did he do? We don't get any details except this. He had to pay for himself and he welcomed all who came to him and he proclaimed the kingdom of God and and he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The reason that those two things matter is because we find a lot of things to hinder us from proclaiming the gospel. The chapters before invite us into Paul's journey and we sort of experience it with him. These two verses open up and they say, now we get to live this with him. We get to continue these two verses. We are the ones who continue to proclaim the good news about Jesus, proclaim the kingdom of God with all boldness and without hindrance. I was thinking about this uh, recently. I have come up with so many, if not every excuse that there could be for why, uh, why, I don't 
proclaim the gospel as often as I should, why I don't share it in particular instances, why um, I, I think of some of the excuses I've made in, in the past for, you know, why um, things I thought should be happening, whether it would be in our church or my ministry or whatever, aren't happening. And I read this proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And I go, what's with the excuses, right? I, I don't know if you ever look at yourself and say, Paul didn't make any excuses. What are the excuses that I'm making? And do they stand up? Or do I have opportunities every single day to love people, to live out the kingdom of God, to preach it with all boldness and without hindrance? One of the, the, the big things as a youth pastor um, was conversation about the way in which uh, teenagers are hindered from living out their faith on, on high school campuses or whatever campuses they're, on, they're, they're at. This is just an excuse, right? I mean, nobody's hindered from living out their faith, from loving the people that are around them. Now, there certainly can be consequences, but Paul was eager to face those consequences. He was eager because there was nothing and no one in the world that he loved more than Jesus. There was nothing and no one in the world that he trusted more than Jesus. And he knew that whatever came at him, whatever happened to him, whatever he faced, the God that he worshiped is the God who raises the dead. This is such a profound trust. This next year, uh, I was sharing with our, our board a couple weeks ago when we had our uh, board retreat, um, just my own sense of work and life and ministry for this next year, uh, one of the ways that I want to say, follow me as I follow Paul and Jesus, Jesus and imitate Paul and however that all works together, all this imitation, um, is, is I want to be bold in proclaiming the truth about Jesus and his kingdom. And I'm wrestling with what that looks like to do that confidently this next year and to stop making excuses. Uh, and so I was just sharing that with the board. Uh, kind of all of us uh, were, were sharing the ways in which we want to provide some leadership for our congregation in, in, this, in this year. Um, and it's true. I would love to see myself Proclaim the gospel without hindrance. To proclaim it boldly. And, um, and I want to do that with you. Um, and, you know, the, the great challenge in saying something like this out loud is all of a sudden there's a community of people who are like, hey, we heard you say this. And so if you don't do this, we're going to make sure you know that. Um, if you do do it, yeah, we'll make sure we, you know that too. Uh, but right, that's kind of what accountability is uh, in, in a community. And so um, one of the, the hopes that our church's leadership has had for a couple years is that places like our homes, groups like our small groups, um, would be communities where we're bold in proclaiming the gospel, where we invite people, as Paul did, Welcome to all who came to him, welcoming people into our spaces, uh, sharing Christ's love with them, uh, inviting them to know God and to trust him. Um, that's one of the things I hope to do this year. I invite you as, as you're thinking through this Christmas time, you know, what does it mean for you to be faithful? What is your role in uh, proclaiming the gospel? Uh, to, be, to be praying about this as well. Um, it's pretty common uh, in the American church that if you were to ask the, the average churchgoer, what's, what's your responsibility as a, a member of a local church in proclaiming the gospel and making sure the gospel goes out? The average Christian would say, invite somebody to church. Um, if, if that's where you're at, 
Let me just say I get that because that's been the message in the church for decades. Your job is to invite people to church. And the truth is, I could care less if you invited somebody to church. That might be weird. I would way rather you share the love of Jesus with somebody, that that you invite them to know Jesus, that you walk with them and, and disciple them, that you bring them into your home, that you bring them into your small group where they can be loved and nurtured and where they can grow up in faith. And then at some point you go, hey, I'm part of this group of people who come together on Sunday mornings and worship God and who who worship God by serving our our community and who do a few other things. Hey, come join me with these people. I would be okay with that. Um, But I would love to challenge you as I'm challenging myself to to be bold this year, uh, to proclaim the gospel without hindrance. As we think about why we would do that, the heart of it, It's the character of God. That our God is a faithful God who has been so faithful to his promises from the very beginning. And so this morning, we think about who this God is and we realize that our sharing of this good news is just the most natural way for people who've been affected by the faithfulness of God to say, all right, God, how how can I be faithful to you? And so um, our team's going to come up, and we're going to continue to to reflect on what does it mean to proclaim God's faithfulness as we come and we prepare to receive uh, communion this morning as we think about being proclaimers of this good news.